I would like to thank the organizer. This is in brief what I said. So we are going to talk today about uh, superconductivity and I'm going to show you some problems that maybe we didn't even know that there are problems and some ideas of how to solve them. Uh, many experimentally, so many um, pictures and photos you will see here. So this is done, the work that you see today will, is done by the members of the group, some former and some present. Some are also here, mainly by uh, Muhammad, a little bit by Itamar who is here, um, and some by, by Ma Maria um, um, as well, and a little bit by, I think, Maya also you will see something. So Maria has a poster later, so you're welcome to visit her. All right, so superconductivity, I don't have to, to tell us, you know, that it's, it's nice, it's important, it has several properties that make it um, um, preferable for quantum technologies or for technologies in general. So one thing is that we have an abrupt phase transition from electric phase transition that we lose the entire resistance. And if we have zero resistance, it means that it can be low power. Um, it can um, drain less um, electricity, uh, less uh, power, be less dissipative. So this is one advantage. Another advantage is the um, uh, magnetic properties of superconductors. So because they are perfect diamagnetic um, materials, um, for, for uh, as we know. And the last one is the electrons have a common wave function or pseudo wave function, depends how you want to describe it. And they have kind of uh, condensating together. So we have, uh, we can have in a device scale um, um, quantum phenomena that we can implement in, in various technologies. All right, so, but there are also some kind of limitations for that. So one thing is the scalability. Um, you know, we are usually to operate um, quantum superconducting devices. We use magnetic fields, but these are very uh, large. They require large um, footprint usually. And if we want to minimize things, it will be difficult. So if we want to have many qubits on one chip at very low temperatures, this can become a hassle to transfer RF signals and uh, magnetic fields and everything operate that. So we maybe have to f can find a way to, to, to treat the scalability in a nice way, and also tunability. Um, tunability means that um, it's difficult to control, you know, even if, if we have a quantum state that is common, so it's difficult and we can even sense it, sometimes it's difficult to control it and maybe we can have better or other uh, ways to control it. So these are the limitations that we have. And in addition to that, we don't have so many materials that are superconductors. Um, and each material has their own, pro has their own properties. Um, so we want to enrich our um, choice. So the first um, um, technology that, that I'm going to address is a um, superconducting nanowire single photon detector, SNSPDs. I think this is maybe the most mature quantum technology, so I know that other people would dispute that, but it's something that already works in a large scale even. And the idea is to have a nanowire um, that is very thin and very narrow, and you apply some bias into that very close to the critical current. And of course, you have no, um, no voltage, but when a, when a photon hits the, the wire, um, you have a current density increases in the side, and you exceed the um, phase transition and the material becomes resistive and you can measure um, this kind of, of uh, photon absorption uh, event. And uh, people use it. What you see here is my colleagues from NASA. They use this technology for real time high, high definition um, data transfer from, from, um, from the space. And this is what they use usually, this, this is what they use in the current missions also in Mars in, in, in the other um, missions by NASA and also by European uh, um, uh, Space um, um, Society. Associ uh, yeah. So, um, but, okay. So these are um, um, already, as I said, they're already used. In China, I think they were the first to show long distance quantum key distribution over 500 kilometers. They did it um, successfully and it works. Um, and also there is a very promising company that many, maybe some of you know, PsyQuantum, they try, they're very ambitious to make uh, one million qubits on one chip. And the main um, 
when I talk to the, to the founders, the main hurdle is the photon detectors, this kind of single photon detectors. The rest they claim that is known, and it's difficult engineering, but no, but then they need the development. So why is it so advantage this, advantageous, this technology? Because it's very fast and very efficient. Um, but actually, I'm a little bit deceiving you. Um, it's true that it's fast and efficient, but it cannot be fast and efficient simultaneously in the same uh, material. Um, so this is a problem. So one of the problems that we have there is that the physics, when we go to low dimensions, is not playing to, um, for us. It's playing against us. Because um, as you may know, we have, um, when we reduce the size of a superconductor, uh, we lose um, some of the superconducting properties, uh, which means like, such as um, TC and the others, and then um, and the delta. So then, then the, we, are, um, sh we shrink the material, and we have some kind of other ways also to do that. So we have, um, uh, eventually, we have some kind of, of um, insulating behavior. And this means that if we go from the bulk behavior to the nano behavior, this is usually what we get. And this is playing against us. So the first, task we, first thing we saw is, you know, how does it work when you scale it down, when you take um, um, materials to low dimensions? And we saw that, that, you know, there is no good tuning parameters. You see a mess here, in, it's in purpose. These are many materials from the literature that you see their TC as a, tuning, as, as a, as a um, um, representative of the quantum properties as a function of the thickness, the sheet resistance, and you see um, um, a big mass that is not clear. And we found that, that there is a way to present that like a scaling law. And um, the thickness times TC is a function of inverse function of, of um, the sheet resistance. And we saw that then things become linear and smooth. And they work nice for all of these materials. And um, it looks like this scaling work law works also for new materials ever since. So they, they, they keep them. Um, citing that, so this is nice to see that something that you predicted empirically works. And uh, when we took it to the, to the next step, so this is a simple power law, you see A over RS over, uh, to the power of B, and we see that this exponent B is di dividing our materials between amorphous and crystalline materials, which means that they are uh, transforming differently this kind of suppression of, of TC, of suppression of superconductive properties. And um, as I said, in the, um, in the technology part, so the superconducting now our um, single photon detectors cannot be fast and efficient simultaneously. So it, in, it turns out that the crystalline materials are very fast and the amorphous materials are very efficient. And as I mentioned, the, it's also known that the physics is, is different for how they, the, what happens to them in thin films. And you know, I cannot take one material and tell it, okay, now be more amorphous or now be more crystalline. This is difficult to do, but we have another trick that we can do with, um, to solve this problem with uh, superconductivity. So this is called the proximity effect. The proximity effect means that if we take one material and put it next to that another material, so then we have a decaying wave function that can penetrate also to the, to the other medium. Okay, and actually the penetration to the other medium is um, going with a coherence length that does not really depend on the host superconductor, but depends mainly on the qualities of the, of the proximitized superconductor, depending if it's ballistic or diffusing. Anyways, we have a, um, an area in which the wave function is living in the other medium, which is not necessarily even superconducting in the first instance. So what we can do, we can take two materials, two superconducting materials. One of them is amorphous, one of them is crystalline, and put them one next to the other. And when we do that, we make an interface um, that the two wave functions from the two, um, uh, um, from the two materials um, coexist together. So although this is a very small area, okay, in a very short scale, so as I said, the um, SNSPD it itself, the detector itself, is very thin film. So we can make something that will be entirely this thickness. So therefore, we will have a coexistence of the amorphous and crystalline materials. And we can, we can make the materials slow and not efficient, which is not what we want. Um, but hopefully, we'll get the opposite, right? And indeed, we, we made such um, detectors. And um, when we characterized them, we saw that they are both fast and efficient with respect to the uh, jitter uh, time and, and reset time 
and um, the, the device efficiency um, and efficiency of these devices. So this was done um, um, also with uh, at MIT with uh, Carl Berger. So the next part is I think that I don't have to. Um, so this is one technology and how we tuned the, the material um, to make um, more select to, uh, to increase the selection of materials. And I think that you know in principle we can describe also Josephson junction in this in this simplified way. And um, one problem that we have in, in quantum devices, or if we want to make um, uh, new platforms from quantum devices, is, as I said, the tunability. So you know that we have Ohm's law, which is great, V equals IR, and we have no power dissipation because we have no resistance. But having no resistance means that also we cannot apply any voltage. And if we cannot apply any voltage, so if we look at normal transistors, so we know that we can do very, it's very small dimensions, up to um, five uh, nanometers, I think that we can do today, maybe two, I think um, commercially available. Um, we can apply the gate voltage and change the um, whatever properties that we want to do in the junction. With just a sun junction, it's a little bit more difficult. We cannot do it very localized. So, um, because we cannot apply voltage, right? So we are looking for alternative ways to, um, to do that. So this is the problem that we are trying to solve and to make materials and the devices for that. So usually, um, you know, like it's difficult to know if we want to know a phase of something. To be sure, as experimentalists, we want to make a reference out of that. Therefore, many times we will have another one that we don't change any parameter there and compare it to each other. And this is like we have an interference and we want to change just the slot, one slot and then uh, one slit, so then, and then to see what happens to the interference as a result of that. Um, so this is a video that I took in Hadera. This is a squid, and um, this is also a squid. Um, so this is a superconducting quantum interference uh, device. So these two Josephson junctions, or weak links, that we put in parallel to each other, and we get interference pattern in a DC uh, squid. So this is how the, they look like. So we have the current, if we look at the current as a function of the, of the magnetic field, so we see that at, some, um, at the blue area, um, we get a superconductor, and uh, above that uh, blue area, we become a metal. Okay, so this is uh, where we are. And, um, and we have this unique interference pattern that, is, um, that, uh, that, give us the, um, that tells us that we have a phase in there, and we can have the, also the amplitude uh, as we see that. Okay, so this is what we have, and the periodicity is, of course, the quantum flux zone. All right, so the first thing that, that we did was actually Itamar uh, did that. So to show that we can have, in, um, or not, not, not necessarily by chronologically, is to, make, to show that you can make um, the squids on thin films and that are planar squids. So instead of having a real Josephson junction with an insulator in between, so we have uh, weak links, and still we can, have, uh, we can get a, a squid interfering uh, pattern, and we saw that it's very robust under various um, conditions, temperatures, magnetic fields, etc. It works well. So then it means that we have a tool that we can try to play around with it. And again, I remind you to tune the quantum properties of, uh, locally of the, of the Josephson junctions. So very naively, we can say that moving along this axis, it means that we do something to the amplitude of the order parameter, of the pseudo wave function. And if we move this direction, it, moves, it means that we change the phase. Um, so the first idea that we had, so we said, let's inject some current. We cannot inject voltage, we cannot apply voltage, but let's, current, uh, let's bias with current directly to the Josephson junction. So again, we want to see um, how it works with respect to an unperturbed um, Josephson junction. So this is what we can do. And the question is what we can get there. So these are the devices, real devices, that, that we made with the equivalent circuits. And the question is what will grating uh, do to this kind of, of, of um, um, device. And we saw that if you apply, um, so depending on the geometry between the gating, you know, because it's a planar, so depending which is narrower and which is wider, if it's a Josephson or the, 
of the gate itself, we can get different phenomena. In one of them, we get something relatively simple that we just shift the phase, but this is like introducing more um, current, I guess, to the system. Although it's not exactly like linearly the current that we put is just adding current, um, but, but this is what, what we get. And the other one is that in the other geometry we saw, um, um, this was in collaboration with AL Books and Professor De La Torre, who is here. Um, so to show that we can get also some kind of amplitude modulation, as you see here, we increase the, the bias and then we open the device kind of. We get the normal interference pattern. You see that we have amplitude change and significant change in this direction. And even the shape is very um, different uh, in here, and um, so it means that we can change both of them locally at the Josephson junction as we wanted. And again, naively speaking, if we look at, um, you see these vertical lines when we move from one um, period to another, so effectively we get something like um, um, zero resistance inductance, sorry. All right. So, so this was one way to, to, to get tunability. The other tunability, this is um, um, current tunability, I would call it. The other one is mechanical tunability. All right. The other is mechanical tunability. We said, okay, we know to grow different materials, as we said, both amorphous and uh, crystalline, and the advantage of the amorphous materials that we can do with them nearly whatever we want. So we can put them on flexible materials, and we said let's, and to do, you know, if you, if you go to, um, to uh, we know to make squids in this, right? So we get something in, and we make a squid, we change of that, and we see what's going on. So we said let's try to do that again with the um, a flexible um, material, which means we put that on a flexible um, uh, Kepton tape in this case even, and then we, let's see what happens to the properties. So we saw first that indeed we get a squid when we grow the material, the amorphous material on various substrates and it's very stable, it remains the same, it's insensitive to the substrate, so this is the main advantage that we have. And we saw that if you take the same device and you bend it, you flex it, okay, you see that the periodicity changes. All right, so actually we get a 14 time increase in periodicity, okay, just by flexing the device. So this is very, was very surprising for us because the radius of curvature is maybe millimeters and the device scale is 100 of nanometers. So we cannot explain it by just changing the flux, for instance, you know, the, the area there or something like that. Um, I can tell you that we are still unsure what the, um, what the origin of the effect exactly is. We try with Emmanuel to simulate the, um, um, the enhancement of the magnetic field, maybe due to the, to the, um, um, to the um, uh, curvature. Again, it gave us maximum a factor of a few, maybe 10% or something like that, I think. And then we're here we're talking about 14 times increase. Um, but it means that we can maybe have some kind of, even if we don't know, we can use it yet. And so we have mechanical tunability of the, um, of, of, of this kind of, of, of uh, devices. So of course we can use it also for coating and for various things and this has been patented. Now, um, the... Okay. Ah, all right, so I spoke too much, too fast. Okay, so, <laughs> um, yeah. The, the, um, I think the last part of, of the talk, so I showed you three types of tunability. One was material tunabilities, which we took the um, amorphous and crystalline materials and put them together. And the other part was um, that I showed you that we had the um, current injection directly uh, to, the, to the junction. And the last one that you saw, the previous one that you saw was the mechanical tunability that we can flex the materials. So because we can make the planar squids, and because, as I told you, that the um, amorphous materials, we can put them on whatever we want, so we can think of other material, other platforms, in which the substrate itself will help us control the um, quantum behavior of the devices. And then we go into another field of research in, in, in our group, 
which is fairway electricity. You know, we like long words in our um, research, superconductivity and fair electricity. So in the fair electricity, it's um, kind of a very, an excellent insulator. Um, you have a hysteresis in the polarization versus electric field. It has very high dielectric um, constant. And because of that, it means that if you have um, this hysteresis um, um, graph shows you that in the absence of any electric field, you still have polarization, either up or down, depending on the history, as, as we know from hysteresis, which means that we have non-volatile um, memory effect between up and down. And this is also high dielectric, which means that we have polarization is equivalent to surface charge. So if we use these effects for super and, and, and hybridize them with the superconductivity, maybe we can get interesting effects. So as I said, a group, a group does this. So this is just to show for the other people in the group that, did it, that are not here. So here we show phase transition of the domain arrangement in the fair electricity. We recently show some kind of, you know, what happens is how the domains, the polarization is stabilized by vacancies of just single oxygen atom. We can here you see folded and unfolded devices that we can do. And the idea indeed was to combine this fair electricity with the superconductivity. So this is what we, uh, what we did. We had a superconductor that was put directly on top of a ferroelectric material with a bottom electrode um, below. And in the beginning, we just wanted to see, does it have any effect on the material itself, on the superconductor, before making even any device? And we saw that it did. Um, what you see here, that there are two kind of, uh, these are cooling curves, and there are two different cooling curves, depending if we are in the positive voltage or negative voltage, all right? By applying um, voltage between the top, uh, top electrode, which is a superconductor, and the bottom electrode, we can switch the polarization. Therefore, we have a surface charge because this, the, 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 the film is rather thin. So it means that it has to be somehow compensated. And if you know, want to hear more details about that, Maria will talk to you uh, in the poster. Or you can ask her later. OK, so the idea is that if you, uh, as you can see, if you have negative polarization, so the right hand side, so closer to 7 Kelvin, you get the TC. Cooling and, and heating, it's the same, okay, no thermal hysteresis. But if you um, switch the polarization to positive voltage, so you see that you have a shift to below six Kelvin. So this is a significant change. And of course, we wanted to see it on the devices themselves, which are the test devices that we have, are the squids, and this is what, what we need. So these are the squids. You see some kind of funny structures. So these are kind of, due to the process, they are um, from, from below when we have some etching. So you have um, this um, PZT and the lead organizers to make some kind of nanocrystal. But this is, um, these are insulating materials and are not affecting the squid itself. And you see that on the right, you see that there are, we have two type of um, interference patterns. Uh, which means that we change TC. You can see also in the IV curves that we change uh, IC, sorry, we change IC um, rather significantly, uh, again, between um, maybe 3 to 4.5, uh, between positive voltage and negative voltage, depending what we put below. So this was our fourth way to do that. You see, so this is what we extracted from that, how we changed the delta, and the charge carrier and the coherence uh, length and etc. So we get rather dramatic change. Again, we don't change the. It's rather very similar to what we wanted to obtain with the, with the uh, from the, we, what we obtain with CMOS devices with normal semiconducting transistors, that we can apply voltage locally and change significantly the properties of the superconductor. So this is what we obtained in here. So the films here were grown by uh, Morgan Trazin from ETH, and as I said. All right, so to summarize, um, I showed you four ways. First, I showed you that, I told you that I think that it's interesting to, to have some kind of tunability to the superconductors to allow us to have, to introduce new platforms for, for quantum devices. Um, and then I showed you um, how we uh, address this, this challenge and by four different um, experimental ways. 
conceptual maybe also. And the first one was the material tunability. They can, we can make new types of superconductors if we are talking about very small dimensions to use this proximity effects. So even two superconductors we can use to proximitize each other and to make a third superconducting material that we control the properties. And the second one, we show that when we inject current to the Josephson junction itself, we can um, control the, um, the wave function, or the pseudo wave function, the order parameter. And the third one, I, we show that the, um, under flexure, we can have um, different um, uh, phenomena for the, um, for the, um, for the superconducting quantum uh, behavior. Uh, we got different, different properties. Not, not all of them we still understand, we, we understand yet, uh, but hopefully we will. But we see that there, it's very, very robust. Um, we did many things to exclude artifacts. Um, you know, it was tested on many chips, many, three different experimental systems. Um, so we did rather hard work to, to show that. And the third one was that I showed you is voltage tunability to have a, a, in, a, a functional material, in this case, a ferroelectric that has voltage controlled polarization. And we can control locally in the in properties of the superconductor and therefore the devices. So thank you very much. <laughs>